Chapter 13 of Following the Color Line, an account of Negro citizenship in the American democracy by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The New Southern Statesmanship Democracy is the progress of all through all under the leadership of the best and the wisest. Mazzini in former chapters i have had much to tell that was unpleasant and perhaps discouraging but it had to be told for it is there and must be honestly met and reckoned with but the chief pleasure of the present task has been the opportunity it has given me to meet the working idealists of the south and to see the courageous and unselfish way in which they are meeting the obstacles which confront them if any man would brighten his faith in human nature, if he would attain a deeper and truer grasp upon the best things of life, let him attend one of the educational rallies of Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, or Texas, and hear the talks of Dr. S. C. Mitchell, President Alderman, J. Y. Joyner, P. P. Claxton, Chancellor Barrow, President Houston, and others, or let him spend a few days at Hampton with Dr. Frizzell, or at Tuskegee with Dr. Washington, or at Calhoun with Miss Thorne. Coming away from a meeting one night at Tuskegee, after there had been speaking in the chapel by both white and colored men, I could not help saying to myself, The Negro problem is not unsolvable. It is being solved, here and now, as fast as any human problem can be solved. Men may be found straining their vision to see some distant and complex solution to the question, have we not heard talk of deportation, extermination, amalgamation, segregation, and the like, when the real solution is under their very eyes, going forward naturally and simply. It is this quiet, constructive movement among the white people in the South which I wish to consider here. In a former chapter I showed how the Negroes of the country are divided into two parties or points of view, the greater led by Booker T. Washington, the lesser by W. E. B. Du Bois. Washington's party is the party of the opportunist and optimist which deals with the world as it is. It is a constructive, practical, cheerful party. It emphasizes duties rather than rights. Dr. Dubois's party, on the other hand, represents the critical point of view. It is idealistic and pessimistic, a party of agitation, emphasizing rights rather than duties but these two points of view are by no means peculiar to negroes they divide all human thought and the action and reaction between them is the mode of human progress division of white leadership in the south white leadership in the south then is divided along similar lines with negro leadership a party of rights and a party of duties but with this wide difference among the negroes as i showed the party of agitation and criticism led by dubois is far inferior both numerically and in influence to the party of opportunity and duties led by washington for the negroes have been forced to concede the futility of trying to progress by political action and legislation by rights specified but not earned washington's preaching has been stop thinking about your rights and get down to work get yourself right and the world will be all right but among the white people of the south the party of agitation and the emphasis of rights rather than duties is still far in the ascendancy led by such men as tillman vardaman jeff davis hoke smith and others it controls for the present the policies of the entire south 
it has much to say of the rights of the white man very little about his duties it is indeed doing for the whites by agitation and legislation often a kind of force exactly what dr dubois would like to do for the negro if he could agitate object fight say both tillman and dubois work says washington now the same logic of circumstances which produced booker t washington and his significant movement among the negroes has produced a group of new and highly able white leaders these new leaders saw that agitation while most necessary in its place would not after all build up the south they saw that although the sort of leader typified by tillman and vardaman was passing laws and winning elections he was not after all getting anywhere that race feeling was growing more bitter often to the injury of southern prosperity that progress is not built upon stump speeches the answer to all this was plain enough let us stop talking forget the race problem and get to work it does not matter where we take hold but let us get to work and the doctrine of work in the south has become a great propaganda almost indeed a passion it has found expression in a remarkable growth of industrial activities cotton mills coal mines iron and steel industries in new methods of farming in spreading railroads but more than all else perhaps it has developed a new enthusiasm for education not only for education of the old classical sort but for industrial and agricultural education the training of workers all this indeed represents the rebound from years of agitation in which the negro has been cussed and discussed as one southerner put it to me beyond the limit of endurance wherever i went in the south among the new industrial and educational leaders i found an active distaste for the discussion of the negro problem these men were too busy with fine new enterprises to be bothered with ancient and unprofitable issues new prescriptions for solving the negro problem when i asked professor dillard of new orleans how he thought the negro question should be treated he replied with silence my prescription says president alderman in his address on southern idealism is silence and slow time faith in the south and wise training for both white and black edgar gardner murphy of alabama himself one of the new leaders has thus outlined the position of the rising southern leadership the south is growing weary of extremists and of sensational problem solvers our coming leadership will have a sense of proportion which will involve a steady refusal to be stampeded by antique nightmares and ethnological melodrama it will possess an increasing passion for getting hold of the real things in a real world and it will deal with one task at a time it will subordinate paper schemes of distant amelioration to duties that will help right now emphasis here is laid upon real things in a real world and duties that will help right now and that is the voice everywhere of the new statesmanship but let us be clear upon one point at the start the platforms of these parties are matters of emphasis one emphasizes rights the other emphasizes duties i have no doubt that booker t washington believes as firmly in the rights of the negro as any leader of his race he has merely ceased to emphasize these rights by agitation until his people have gained more education and more property until by honest achievement 
they are prepared to exercise their rights with intelligence in the same way the views of many of the new southern white leaders of whom i shall speak in this article have not radically changed so far as the negro is concerned some of them i have found do not differ from tillman upon essential points but like washington they have decided not to emphasize controversial matters and go to work and develop the south and the people of the south for the good of the whole country if the test has to come in the long run between white men and colored men as it will have to come and is coming all the time they want it to be an honest test of efficiency the fittest here too will survive there is no escaping the great law but these new thinkers wish the test of fitness to be not mere physical force not mere brute power whether expressed in lynching or politics but the higher test of real capacity they have supreme confidence that the white man is superior on his merits in any contest and washington on his side is willing to indeed he must take up the gauntlet thus thrown down the condition in the south may be likened to a battle in which the contestants weary of profitless and wordy warfare are turning homeward to gather up new ammunition each side is passionately getting education acquiring land developing wealth and industry preparing for the struggles of the future and it is a fine and wholesome tendency in a large sense indeed this movement typifies the progressive thought of the entire country for it means a sincere attempt to change the plane of battle for battle there must be from one of crude primitive force whether physical political or indeed industrial to one of intellectual efficiency or usefulness to society and these working idealists of both races understand one another better than most people think dr mitchell and president alderman understand booker t washington and he understands them this is not saying that they agree but agreement upon every abstract principle is not necessary where both parties are hard at work at practical definite and immediate tasks self-criticism in the south the new southern statesmanship began as all new movements begin with self-criticism henry w grady a real statesman by criticizing the old order of things announced the beginning of the new south an active working hopeful south he saw the faults of the old exclusive agricultural life and the danger of low-class uneducated labor and he urged industrial development and a better school system r h edmonds of baltimore through the manufacturer's record and many other able business leaders have done much to bring about the new industrial order the day of new railroads cotton mills and coal mines the day of cities but it is in the educational field that the development of the new statesmanship has been most remarkable although it was unfortunate in one way that so much of the political leadership of the south should have fallen to men of the type of vardaman jeff davis and heflin it is highly fortunate in another way for it has driven the broadest and ablest minds in the south to seek expression in other lines of activity in industry and in the church but particularly in educational leadership it is not without profound significance that the great american general lee turned his attention and gave his highest energies after appomattox not to politics but to education the south today has a group of schoolmen 
who are leaders of extraordinary force and courage. The ministry has also attained an influence in the South which it does not possess in most parts of the North. The influence of Bishop Galloway of Mississippi, Dr. John E. White, and Dr. C. B. Wilmer of Atlanta, and many others has been notable. For many years after the war, the South was passive with exhaustion. Young men, who were not afraid, had to grow up to the task of reconstruction. And no one who has not traced the history of the South since the war can form any conception of the magnitude of that task. It was essentially the building of a new civilization. The leaders were compelled not only to face abject poverty, but they have had to deal constantly with the problem of a laboring class just released from slavery. At every turn, in politics, in industry, in education, they were confronted with the Negro and the problem of what to do with him. Where one schoolhouse would do in the North, they were compelled to build two schoolhouses, one for white children, one for black. It took from twenty-five to forty years of hard work after the war before the valuation of wealth in the South had again reached the figures of 1860. The valuations in the year 1890 for several of the states were less than in 1860. South Carolina in 1900, forty years after the beginning of the war, had only just caught up with the record of 1860. Since 1890, however, the increase everywhere has been swift and sure. Courage and Vision of New Leaders Well, it required courage and vision in the earlier days to go before a poverty-stricken people, who had not yet enough means for living comfortably, and to demand of them that they build up and support two systems of education in the South. And yet that was exactly the task of the educational pioneers. Statesmanship, as I have said, begins with self-criticism. While the mere politician is flattering his followers and confirming them in their errors, the true statesman is criticizing them and spurring them to new beliefs and stronger activities. While the politician is pleading rights, the statesman also dares to emphasize duties. While the politicians in the South, not all, but many of them, have been harping on race prejudice and getting themselves elected to office by reviving ancient hatred, these new statesmen have been facing courageously forward, telling the people boldly of the conditions of illiteracy which surround them, and demanding that schools be built and every child, white and black, be educated. In many cases they have had to overcome a settled prejudice against education, especially education of Negroes, and after that was overcome they have had to build up a sense of social responsibility for universal education before they could count on getting the money they needed for their work. After the war, the North, in one form or another, poured much money into the South for teaching the Negroes. Lesser sums, like those coming from the Peabody Fund, were contributed toward white schools. But in the long run, there can be no real education which is not self-education. Outside influences may help, or indeed hurt, but until a state, like a man, is inspired with a desire for education and a willingness to make sacrifices to get it, the people will not become enlightened. In the middle eighties, the fire of this inspiration began to blaze up in many parts of the South. Various combustible elements were present. A sense of the appalling condition of illiteracy existing in the South, a pride and independence of character which was hurt by the gifts of money from the North, a feeling that the Negroes, in some instances, 
were getting better educational opportunities than the white children and finally the splendid idealism of young men who saw clearly that the only sure foundation for democracy is universal education inspiration of democracy in north carolina not unnaturally the movement found its earliest expression in north carolina which has been the most instinctively democratic of southern states from the beginning of the country north carolina with its population of scotch presbyterians and quakers has been inspired with a peculiar spirit of independence when i was in charlotte i went to see the monument which commemorates the mecklenburg declaration of independence the work of a group of stout-hearted citizens who decided before the country at large was ready for it to declare their independence of british rule north carolina was among the last of the southern states to secede from the union and its treatment of its negroes all along has been singularly liberal for example in several southern states little or no provision is made for the negro defective classes but at raleigh i visited a large asylum for negro deaf dumb and blind which is conducted according to the most improved methods and today north carolina is freer politically the state is nearer a new and healthy party alignment than any other southern state except tennessee and possibly kentucky such a soil was fertile for new ideas and new movements in eighteen eighty five two young men charles d mciver and edwin a alderman now president of the university of virginia began a series of educational campaigns under the supervision of the state they spoke in every county rousing the people to build better schoolhouses and to send legislators to raleigh who should be more liberal in educational appropriations in many cases their rallies were comparable with the most enthusiastic political meetings only no one was asking to be elected to office and the only object was public service as alderman has said it was an effort to move the center of gravity from the courthouse to the schoolhouse and it really moved the state took fire and has been a fire ever since governor aycock made the educational movement a part of his campaign governor glenn has been hardly less enthusiastic and the development of the school system has been little short of amazing when i was in raleigh last spring j y joyner state superintendent of schools who was also one of the pioneer campaigners told me that a new schoolhouse was being built for every day in the year and new school libraries established at the same rate between nineteen hundred and nineteen o six the total amount of money expended for schools in North Carolina more than doubled, and while the school population in the same years has increased only 6%, the daily attendance had increased 28%. North Carolina compared with Massachusetts. To give a graphic idea of the progress in education, I can do no better than to show the increase in public expenditures since 1872. 1872 total school expenditures, $42,856. 1880 total school expenditures, $349,831. 1890 total school expenditures, seven hundred and eighty seven thousand one hundred and forty five dollars nineteen hundred total school expenditures one million ninety one thousand six hundred and ten dollars nineteen o six total school expenditures two million two hundred and ninety one thousand 
and fifty three dollars i have looked into the statistics and i find that north carolina spends more per hundred dollars of taxable property for school purposes than massachusetts which is perhaps the leading american state in educational expenditures in nineteen o six north carolina raised forty cents on every one hundred dollars while massachusetts raised thirty eight point seven cents but this does not mean of course that north carolina has reached the standard of massachusetts it only shows how the people though not rich have been willing to tax themselves and they have only just begun the rate of illiteracy of the state as in all the south is still excessive among both white and colored people according to the last census north carolina has more illiterate white people than any other state in the union a condition due of course to its large population of mountaineers while the progress already made is notable the leaders still have a stupendous task before them at the present time although taxing itself more per hundred dollars worth of property than massachusetts north carolina pays only two dollars and sixty three cents each year for the education of each child whereas massachusetts expends twenty four dollars and eighty nine cents nearly ten times as much i do not wish to overemphasize the work in north carolina i am merely using conditions there as a convenient illustration of what is going on in greater or less degree all over the south one of the group of early enthusiasts in north carolina was p p claxton who is now in charge of the educational campaign in tennessee with president dabney formerly of the university of tennessee and state superintendent minders mr claxton has conducted a statewide campaign for education every available occasion has been utilized picnics court days decoration days and often the audiences have been larger and more enthusiastic than political rallies indeed the meetings have been carried on much like a political campaign at one time over one hundred speakers were in the field every county in the state was stumped and in two years it was estimated that over half of the entire population of the state actually attended the meetings labor unions and women's clubs were stirred to activity resolutions were passed politicians were called upon to declare themselves and teachers organizations were formed the result was most notable in nineteen o two the state expended one million eight hundred thousand dollars for educational purposes in nineteen o eight six years later the total will exceed four million dollars a similar campaign has been going on in virginia under the auspices of the cooperative educational association in which the leaders have been dr s c mitchell professor bruce payne president alderman and others in this work ex-governor montague has also been a force for good both while he was governor and since and governor swanson at present is actively interested local leagues were formed in every part of the state to the number of three hundred and twenty four negroes have also organized along the same line and now have ten local associations in five counties how the south is taxing itself one of the most striking features of the movement has been the development of the system of local taxation for school purposes which is a long step in the direction of democracy in the past the people have looked more or less to some outside source for help to state or national funds or the private gifts of philanthropists 
or they have depended upon private schools but now they are voting to take the burden themselves in other words with the building up of a popular school system supported by local taxation education in the south is becoming for the first time democratic it would be difficult to overestimate the importance of this movement in stimulating the local pride and self-reliance of the people or in inspiring each community with educational enthusiasm another development of profound influence has been going on in the south as i have already pointed out the so-called northern philanthropist has long been interested in southern education especially negro education for years his activities awakened and indeed still awaken a good deal of hostility in some parts of the south many southerners have felt that the northerners however good their intentions did not understand southern conditions and that some of the money was expended in a way that did not help the cause of progress in the south end of part one of chapter thirteen part two of chapter thirteen of following the color line an account of negro citizenship in the american democracy by ray stannard baker this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. South and North work together. But both the Northerners, whatever their mistakes in method may have been, and the new Southern leaders were intensely and sincerely interested in the same thing, namely, better education and better conditions in the South. It was natural that these two groups of earnest and reasonable men should finally come together in a spirit of cooperation. And this is, indeed, what has happened. Out of a series of quiet conferences held in the South grew what has been called the Ogden Movement and the Southern Education Board. This organization was made up of three different classes of men. First, a group of the Southern leaders of whom I have spoken, Mitchell, Alderman, Dabney, Curry, Houston, Hill, McIver, Claxton, Edgar Gardner Murphy, Sidney J. Bowie, and Henry E. Fries. Second, Southern men who, living in the North, were yet deeply interested in the progress of the South. Men like Walter H. Page, George Foster Peabody, and Frank R. Chambers and finally the northerners robert c ogden who is president of the board william h baldwin h h hanna dr wallace buttrick albert shaw and dr g s dickerman one of the inspirers of the movement also a member of the board was dr h b frizzell who followed general armstrong as principal of the hampton institute each year conferences have been held in the south a feature of which has been the ogden special a special train from the north bringing northern citizens to southern institutions and encouraging a more intimate acquaintanceship on both sides no one influence has been more potent than this in developing a spirit of nationalism in the southern educational movement so far in this chapter i have had very little to say about the negro and especially negro education it is important to know the view of the new leadership on this question i have shown in previous articles that the majority view in the south was more or less hostile to the education of the negro or at least to his education beyond the pair rudiments the new leaders have recognized this feeling and while without exception they believe that the negro must be educated and most of them have said so openly the general policy has been to emphasize white education and unite the people on that in education one of the leaders said to me it doesn't matter much where we begin if we can arouse the spirit of the school 
the people are going to see that it is as important to the state to have a trained negro as it is to have a trained white man one of the troubles in the south one of the reasons for the prejudice against education and particularly negro education has arisen from the fact that what has been called education was not really education at all in the first place many of the schools have been so poor and the teachers so inefficient that the education acquired was next to worthless there was not enough of it nor was it of a kind to give the negro any real hold upon life and it often hurt him far more than it helped much of the prejudice in the south against negro education is unquestionably due to the wretched school system which in many places has not really educated anybody but deeper than all this the old conception in the south of a school was for a long time the old aristocratic conception what someone has called useless culture of educating a class of men not to work but to despise work that idea of education has wrought much evil especially among the negroes it has taught both white and colored men not the doctrine of service which is necessary to democracy but it has given them a desire for artificial superiority which is the characteristic of aristocracies it has made the negro uppish and bumptious it has caused some white men to argue their superiority when they had no basis of accomplishment or usefulness to make them really superior the inspiration of hampton institute but when the idea of education began to be democratic when men began to think more of their duties than of their rights a wholly new sort of school appeared and it appeared first among the negroes the country has not yet begun to realize the debt of gratitude which it owes to the promoters of hampton institute to the genius of general armstrong its founder and to the organizing ability of dr h b frizzell who followed him these men will be more highly honored a hundred years from now than they are today for americans will then appreciate more fully their service to the democracy the hampton idea is the teaching of work of service of humility of duties to god and to man it is in the highest sense the democratic idea in education and it has come as most great movements have come from the needs and the struggles of those who are downtrodden and outcast and how wonderfully the idea has spread out of hampton sprung tuskegee and calhoun and coaliga and scores of other negro schools until today nearly all negro institutions for higher training in the south have industrial or agricultural departments the best southern white people were and are friendly to schools of this new type they thought at first that Hampton and Tuskegee were going to train servants in the old personal sense of servants who become only cooks, butlers, and farmers, and many still have that aristocratic conception of service. But the Hampton idea of servants is a much greater one, for it is the democratic idea of training men who will serve their own people and thereby serve the country men who graduate from hampton and tuskegee become leaders of their race they buy and cultivate land they set up business establishments in short they become producers and state builders in the largest sense new world idea of education the idea of hampton is the new world idea of education and white people in the south and in the north as well are now applying it everywhere in their educational movements agricultural and industrial schools for white boys and girls are spreading throughout the south schools to teach work just as hampton teaches it 
only last year the state of georgia provided for eleven new agricultural schools in various parts of the state and there is already talk in the south as in the north of agricultural training in high schools these men white and black who are educated for democratic service will in time become masters of the state the new leaders then of whom i have spoken do not oppose negro education they favor it and will go forward steadily with the task of bringing it about so far the negro public schools have felt little of the new impulse in some states and localities as i have shown in other chapters the negro schools have actually retrograded where the white schools have been improving rapidly but that is the continuing influence of the old leadership the new men have not yet come fully into their own i could quote indefinitely from the real statesmen of the south regarding negro education but i have too little space senator lamar of mississippi once said the problem of race in a large part is a problem of illiteracy most of the evils which have grown up out of the problem have arisen from a condition of ignorance prejudice and superstition remove these and the simpler elements of the question will come into play i will go with those who will go furthest in this matter no higher note has been struck in educational ideals than in the declaration of principles adopted last winter 1907 at the meeting of the Southern Educational Association at Lexington, Kentucky, an exclusively Southern gathering of white men and women. Their resolutions, which for lack of space cannot be here printed in full, should be read by every man and woman in the country who is interested in the future of democratic institutions. I copy here only a few of the declarations one all children regardless of race creed sex or the social station or economic condition of their parents have equal right to and should have equal opportunity for such education as will develop to the fullest possible degree all that is best in their individual natures and fit them for the duties of life and citizenship in the age and community in which they live two to secure this right and provide this opportunity to all children is the first and highest duty of the modern democratic state and the highest economic wisdom of an industrial age and community without universal education of the best and highest type there can be no real democracy either political or social nor can agriculture manufactures or commerce ever attain their highest development three education in all grades and in all legitimate directions being for the public good the public should bear the burden of it the most just taxes levied by the state or with the authority of the state by any smaller political division are those levied for the support of education no expenditures can possibly produce greater returns and none should be more liberal the new south on negro education concerning negro education i am publishing the resolutions in full because they voice the present thought of the best leadership in the south one we endorse the accepted policy of the states of the south in providing educational facilities for the youth of the negro race believing that whatever the ultimate solution of this grievous problem may be education must be an important factor in that solution two we believe that the education of the negro in the elementary branches of education should be made thorough and should include specific instruction in hygiene and home sanitation for the better protection of both races three we believe that in the secondary education of negro youth 
emphasis should be placed upon agriculture and the industrial occupations, including nurse training, domestic science, and home economics. 4. We believe that for practical, economical, and psychological reasons, Negro teachers should be provided for Negro schools. 5. We advise instruction in normal schools and normal institutions by white teachers, whenever possible, and closer supervision of courses of study and methods of teaching in Negro normal schools by the State Department of Education. 6. We recommend that in urban and rural Negro schools there should be closer and more thorough supervision, not only by city and county superintendents, but also by directors of music, drawing, manual training, and other special topics. 7. We urge upon school authorities everywhere the importance of adequate buildings, comfortable seating, and sanitary accommodations for Negro youth. 8. We deplore the isolation of many Negro schools, established through motives of philanthropy, from the life and sympathies of the communities in which they are located. We recommend the supervision of all such schools by the state, and urge that their work and their methods be adjusted to the civilization in which they exist, in order that the maximum good of the race and of the community may be thereby attained. 9. On account of economic and psychological differences in the two races, we believe that there should be a difference in courses of study and methods of teaching, and that there should be such an adjustment of school curricula as shall meet the evident needs of Negro youth. 10. We insist upon such an equitable distribution of the school funds that all the youth of the Negro race shall have at least an opportunity to receive the elementary education provided by the state, and in the administration of state laws and in the execution of this educational policy, we urge patience, toleration, and justice. Signed, G. R. Glenn, P. P. Claxton, J. H. Phillips, C. B. Gibson, R. N. Rourke, J. H. Van Sickle, Committee. In this connection, also let me call attention to the reports of J. Y. Joyner, Superintendent of Education, and Charles L. Coon of North Carolina, for a broad view of Negro education. I have already shown how the South and the North came together in educational relationships in the Southern Education Board. I have pointed it out as a tendency toward nationalization in educational interests. But the Southern Education Board, while it contained both Northern and Southern white men, was primarily interested in white education and contained no Negro members. At the time the board was organized, an active interest in the Negro would have defeated, in part at least, its declared purpose. The South, the North, and the Negro at last worked together. Since that time, another highly significant movement has arisen. In 1907, Miss Jeans, a wealthy Quakeress of Philadelphia, gave a million dollars for the encouragement of Negro primary education. She placed it in the hands of Dr. H. B. Frizzell of Hampton and Dr. Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee. In the organization of the board for the control of this fund and its work, a further step forward in nationalization and, indeed, in the direction of democracy was made. It marks a new development in the cooperation of all the forces for good in the solution of this difficult national problem. The membership of the board includes not only southern and northern white men, but also several leading Negroes. The president and general director is a southern white man, coming of an old family, 
James H. Dillard, Dean of Tulane University of New Orleans. It will be of interest to publish here a full list of the members, because they represent, in more ways than one, the new leadership not only in the South but in the nation. Southern White Men James H. Dillard, President David C. Barrow, Chancellor, University of Georgia Belton Gilreath, Manufacturer and Mine Owner, Alabama Dr. S. C. Mitchell of Richmond College, Richmond, Virginia Northern White Men Robert C. Ogden of New York Andrew Carnegie of New York Talcott Williams of Philadelphia George McEnany, President of the City Club of New York William H. Taft of Ohio to these must be added Dr. H. B. Frizzell of Hampton Institute, a northerner whose work and residence has long been in the South. George Foster Peabody, treasurer, a Georgian, trustee of the University of Georgia, who resides in the North. Walter H. Page, the editor of The World's Work, a North Carolinian who has long lived in the North. Negro Membership Booker T. Washington Bishop Abraham Grant of Kansas R. R. Moton of Hampton Institute, Secretary of the Board J. C. Napier, a banker of Nashville, Tennessee R. D. Smith, a farmer of Paris, Texas In a true sense, the Southern Education Board and the Jeans Fund Board represent organizations of working idealists. Such cooperation as this between reasonable, broad-minded, and unselfish men of the entire country is, at the present moment, the real solution of our problems. It is the solution of the Negro problem, all the solution there will ever be. For there is no finality in human endeavor, there is only activity, and when that activity is informed with the truth and inspired with faith and courage, it is not otherwise than success, for it is the best that human nature at any given time can do. In making this statement, I do not, of course, wish to infer that conditions are as good as can be expected, and that nothing remains to be done. As a matter of fact, the struggle is just beginning. As I have shown in previous chapters, all the forces of entrenched prejudice and ignorance are against the movement. The political leaders who still dominate the South are as hostile as they dare to be. The task is, indeed, too big for the South alone, or the North alone, or the white man alone. It will require all the strength and courage the nation possesses. UNIVERSITIES FEEL THE NEW IMPULSE Besides the campaign for better common schools, the educational revival has also renewed and revivified all the higher institutions of learning in the South. The state universities, especially, have been making extraordinary progress. I shall not soon forget my visit to the University of Georgia at Athens nor the impression I received while there of strong men at work, not merely erecting buildings of mortar and brick, but establishing a new sort of university system, which shall unify and direct to one common end all of the educational activities of the state, beginning with the common school and reaching upward to the university itself, including the agricultural and industrial schools, and even the Negro College of Agriculture. The University of Georgia is one of the oldest state colleges in America, and the ambition of its leaders is to make it one of the greatest. Mr. Hodgson drove me around the campus, which has recently been extended until it contains nearly a thousand acres. He showed me where the new buildings are to be, 
the drives and the bridges much of it is yet a vision of the future but it is the sort of vision that comes true i spent a day with president soul of the agricultural college on his special educational train which covered a considerable part of the state of georgia stopping at scores of towns where the speakers appeared before great audiences of farmers and made practical addresses on cotton and corn and cattle raising and on education generally and everywhere the practical work of these public educators was greeted with enthusiasm i heard from professor stewart of his work in organizing rural high schools in encouraging local taxation and in bringing the work of the public schools into closer correlation with that of the university seeing the educational work of states like georgia north carolina virginia and others one cannot but feel that the time is coming shortly when the north will be going south for new ideas and new inspiration in education in a brief review like this i have been able of course to give only the barest outline of a very great work and i have mentioned only a few among hundreds of leaders the work i have described is only illustrative of what is going on in greater or less degree everywhere in the south many important developments have come from these campaigns for education the actual building of new schoolhouses and the expenditure of more money for the struggle with illiteracy is only one of many results for the crusade for education supplemented by the new industrial impulse in the south has awakened a new spirit of self-help the success with which the public was aroused in the educational campaign has inspired leaders in all lines of activity with new courage and faith it is a spirit of youthfulness which is not afraid to attempt anything much printer's ink has been expended in trying to account for the spread of the anti-saloon movement throughout the south but there is nothing strange about it it is indeed only another manifestation of the new southern spirit the desire to get things right in the south and this movement will further stir men's minds develop self-criticism and reveal to the people their power of concerted action whether the politicians are with them or not it is indeed significant that the women of the south perhaps for the first time have become a powerful influence in public affairs their organizations have helped in some instances led in both the educational and the anti-saloon movement no leaders in the virginia educational movement have been more useful than mrs l r dashiell and mrs b b munford of richmond practically all the progress of the south both industrial and educational has been made by non-political movements and non-political leaders often in opposition to the political leaders indeed nearly every one of the hopeful movements of the south has had to capture some entrenched stronghold of the old political captains in several states for example the school systems a few years ago were crippled by political domination and nepotism superintendents principals and teachers were frequently appointed not for their ability but because they were good members of the party or because they were related to politicians new statesmen against old politicians in alabama i found prominent men attacking the fee system of payment of lesser magistrates the evil in this system lies in the encouragement it gives to trivial litigation and the arrest of citizens for petty offenses let me give a single example a negro had another negro arrested for assault and battery both appeared in court the accused negro was tried and finally sent to the chain gang 
the justice suggested to the convicted man that if he wanted satisfaction he should turn around and have his accuser arrested which he did promptly accusing him of abusive language another trial was held and in the end both negroes found themselves side by side in the chain gang the magistrate the constable the sheriff had all drawn liberal fees and the private contractor who hired the chain gang and who also stood in with the politicians had obtained another cheap laborer for his work it is a vicious circle which has enabled the politicians and their backers to profit at every turn from the weakness and evil of both negro and low-class white man in attacking the fee system and the old evil chain gang system as the new leaders are doing in many parts of the south in closing the saloons always a bulwark of low politics in building up a new school system free from selfish control the new leaders are striking squarely at the roots of the old political aristocracy undermining it and cutting it away it is sure to fall and in its place the south will rear a splendid new leadership of constructive ability and unselfish patriotism there will be a division on matters of vital concern and a turning from ancient and worn-out issues to new interests and activities when that time comes the whole nation will again profit by the genius of southern statesmanship and we shall again have southern presidents already the old type of politician sees the handwriting of fate he knows not which way to turn at one moment he harps more fiercely and bitterly than ever before on the issue which has maintained him so long in power the negro and at the next moment he seizes frantically on some one of the new issues education prohibition anti-railroad hoping thereby to maintain himself and his old party control but he cannot do it every force in the south is already making for new things for more democracy for more nationalization end of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of Following the Color Line, An Account of Negro Citizenship in the American Democracy, by Ray Stannard Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. What to do about the Negro. A few conclusions. The deeper one delves into the problem of race, the humbler he becomes concerning his own views studying a black man he discovers that he must study human nature the best he can do then is to present his latest and clearest thought knowing that newer light and deeper knowledge may modify his conclusions it is out of such expressions of individual thought no one man has or can have all the truth and the kindly discussion which follows it and why shouldn't it be kindly that arises finally that power of social action which we call public opinion together not otherwise we may approach the truth the world today is just beginning to meet new phases of the problem of race difference improved transportation and communication are yearly making the earth smaller as americans we are being brought every year into closer contact with black and yellow people we are already disturbed not only by a negro race problem but on our pacific coast and in hawaii we have a japanese and chinese problem in the philippine islands we have a tangle of race problems in comparison with which our southern situation seems simple other nations are facing complexities equally various and difficult england's problems in both south africa and india are largely racial 
the great issue in australia where chinese labor has become a political question is expressed in the campaign slogan a white australia what is the race problem essentially then what is the race problem the race problem is the problem of living with human beings who are not like us whether they are in our estimation our superiors or inferiors whether they have kinky hair or pigtails whether they are slant-eyed hook-nosed or thick-lipped in its essence it is the same problem magnified which besets every neighborhood even every family in our own country we have ten million negroes distributed among seventy-five million white people they did not come here to invade us or because they wanted to come we brought them by force and at a fearful and cruel sacrifice of life we brought them not to do them good but selfishly that they might be compelled to do the hard work and let us live lazily eat richly sleep softly we treated them as beasts of burden i say we for the north owned slaves too at first and emancipated them by selling them to the south because it did not pay to keep them nor was the anti-slavery sentiment peculiar to the north voices were raised against the institution of slavery by many southern statesmen from jefferson down men who knew by familiar observation of the evil of slavery especially for the white man differences between southern and northern attitudes toward the race problem but differences are apparent in the outlook of the south and north which must be pointed out before we can arrive at any general conclusions by understanding the reasons for race feeling we shall be the better able to judge of the remedies proposed in the first place the south is still clouded with bitter memories of the war and especially of the reconstruction period the north cannot understand how deep and real this feeling is how it has been warped into the souls of even the third generation the north victorious forgot but the south broken and defeated remembered until i had been a good while in the south and talked with many people i had no idea what a social cataclysm like the civil war really meant to those who were defeated how long it echoes in the hearts of men and women the negro has indeed suffered suffered on his way upward but the white man with his higher cultivation his keener sensibilities his memories of a departed glory has suffered far more i have tried as i have listened to the stories of struggle which only the south knows to put myself in the place of these anglo-saxon men and women and i think i can understand a little at least of what it must have meant to meet defeat loss of relatives and friends grinding poverty the chaos of reconstruction and after all that to have always at elbow touch the unconscious cause of all their trouble the millions of inert largely helpless negroes who imbued with a sharp sense of their rights are attaining only slowly a corresponding appreciation of their duties and responsibilities the ruin of the war left the south poor and it has provided itself slowly with educational advantages it is a long step behind the north in the average of education among white people not less than colored but more than all else perhaps the south is in the throes of vast economic changes it is in the transition stage between the old wasteful semi-feudal civilization and the sharp new city and industrial life it is suffering the common pains of readjustment and being hurt it is not wholly conscious of the real reason for example many of the troubles between the races attributed to the perversity of the negro 
are often only the common difficulties which arise out of the relationship of employer and employee in other words difficulties in the south are often attributed to the race problem which in the north we know as the labor problem for the south even yet has not fully established itself in the wage system payment of negroes in the country is still often a matter of old clothes baskets from the white man's kitchen or store with occasionally a little money which is often looked upon as an indulgence rather than a right no race ever yet has sprung directly from slavery into the freedom of a full-fledged wage system no matter what the laws were it is not insignificant of progress that the basket habit is coming to be looked upon as thievery organized charity in the cities is taking the place of indiscriminate personal gifts wages are more regularly paid and measure more accurately the value of the service rendered but the relationships between the races still smack in no small degree especially in matters of social contact which are always the last to change of the old feudal character they are personal and sentimental they express themselves in the personal liking for the old mammies in the personal contempt for the smart negro a large part of the south still believes that the negro was created to serve the white man and for no other purpose this is especially the belief of the conservative country districts if these negroes become doctors and merchants or buy their own farms a southern woman said to me as a clinching argument against negro education what shall we do for servants another reason for the feeling in the south against the negro is that the south has never had any other laboring class of people to speak of with which to compare the negro all the employers have been white most of the workers have been black the north on the other hand has had a constant procession of ignorant working people of various sorts the north is familiar with the progress of alien people wherein the working man of today becomes the employer of tomorrow which has not happened in the south confusion of labor and race problems an illustration of the confusion between the race problem and the labor problem is presented in certain southern neighborhoods by the influx of european immigrants because the italian does the work of the negro a tendency exists to treat him like a negro in louisiana on the sugar plantations italian white women sometimes work under negro foremen and no objection is made a movement is actually under way in mississippi to keep the children of italian immigrants out of the white schools in not a few instances white workmen have been held in peonage like negroes several such cases are now pending in the courts here is a dispatch showing how new italian immigrants were treated in one part of mississippi only the italians unlike the negroes have had an active government behind them mobile alabama october third the italian government has taken notice of the situation at sumrall mississippi where the native whites are endeavoring to keep italian children out of the schools and where a leader of the italians was taken to the woods and whipped the italian consul at new orleans count g moroni reached mobile this afternoon and began an investigation of the situation he today heard the story of frank cialioni the leader of the italian colony at sumrall who was a few days ago decoyed from his home at night with a bogus message from new orleans and unmercifully whipped by a mob of white men a decided tendency also exists to charge up to the negro because he is a negro 
all the crimes which are commonly committed by any ignorant neglected poverty-stricken people only last summer we had in new york what the newspaper reporters called a crime wave the crime in that case was what is designated in the south as the usual crime offenses against women for which negroes are lynched but in new york not a negro was implicated i was struck while in philadelphia by a presentment of a grand jury in judge kinsey's court upon the subject of a crime wave which read thus in closing our duties as jurymen we wish to call to the attention of this court the large proportion of cases presented to us for action wherein the offenses were charged to either persons of foreign birth or those of the colored race and we feel that some measures should be taken to the end that our city should be relieved of both the burden of the undesirable alien and the irresponsible colored person here it will be seen the undesirable alien and irresponsible colored person are classed together although it is significant of the greater prejudice against the colored man that the newspaper report of the action of the grand jury should be headed negro crime abnormal without referring to the alien at all when i inquired at the prosecutor's office about the presentiment i was told oh the dagoes are just as bad as the negroes and both are bad not because they are negroes or italians but because they are ignorant neglected poverty-stricken thus in the dust and confusion of the vast readjustments now going on in the south the discomfort of which both races feel but neither quite understands we have the white man blindly blaming the negro and the negro blindly hating the white when they both understand that many of the troubles they are having are only the common gall spots of the new industrial harness there will be a better living together i do not wish to imply of course that an industrial age or the wage system furnishes an ideal condition for race relationships for in the north the negro struggle for survival in the competitive field is accompanied as i have shown elsewhere by the severest suffering the condition of negroes in indianapolis new york and philadelphia is in some ways worse than it is anywhere in the south but say what we will the wage system is one step upward from the old feudalism the negro is treated less like a slave and more like a man in the north it is for this reason that negroes no matter what their difficulties of making a living in the north rarely wish to go back to the south and as the south develops industrially it will approximate more nearly to northern conditions in southern cities today because of industrial development the negro is treated more like a man than he is in the country and this is one reason why negroes crowd into the cities and can rarely be persuaded to go back into the country unless they can own their own land but the south is rapidly shaking off the remnants of the old feudalism development of mines and forests the extension of manufacturing the introduction of european immigrants the inflow of white northerners better schools more railroads and telephones are all helping to bring the south up to the economic standard of the north there will be a further break-up of baronial tenant farming the plantation store will disappear the ruinous credit system will be abolished and there will be a widespread appearance of independent farm owners both white and black this will all tend to remove the personal and sentimental attitude of the old southern life the negro will of necessity be judged more and more as a man not as a slave or dependent 
in short the country south and north will become economically more homogeneous but even when the south reaches the industrial development of the north the negro problem will not be solved it is certainly not solved in new york or philadelphia where industrial development has reached its highest form the prejudice in those cities as i have shown has been growing more intense as negro population increased what then will happen two elements in every race problem two elements appear in every race problem the first race prejudice the repulsion of the unlike second economic or competitive jealousy both operate for example in the case of the irishman or italian but with the negro and chinaman race prejudice is greater because the difference is greater the difficulty of the negro in this country is the color of his skin the symbol of his difference in china the difficulty of the white trader is his whiteness his difference race lines in short are drawn by white men not because the other race is inferior the japanese and chinese are in many ways our superiors nor because of criminality certain classes of foreigners are more criminal in our large cities than the negroes nor because of laziness but because of discernible physical differences black skin almond eyes pigtails hooked noses a peculiar bodily odor or small stature that dislike of a different people is more or less instinctive in all men a tendency has existed on the part of northern students who have no first-hand knowledge of the masses of negroes to underestimate the force of race repulsion on the other hand the southern student who is confronted with the negroes themselves is likely to overestimate racial repulsion and underestimate economic competition as a cause of the difficulty the profoundest question indeed is to decide how much of the so-called problem is due to race repulsion and how much to economic competition this leads us to the most sinister phase of the race problem as i have shown we have the two elements of conflict instinctive race repulsion and competitive jealousy what is easier for the race in power the white race in this country the yellow race in asia than to play upon race instinct in order to serve selfish ends how shrewdly the labor union whether in san francisco or atlanta seizes upon that race hatred to keep the black or yellow man out of the union and thereby control all the work for its members race prejudice played upon becomes a tool in clinching the power of the labor monopoly how the politician in the south excites race hatred in order that he may be elected to office vardaman governed because he could make men hate one another more bitterly than his opponent the rev thomas dixon has appealed in his books and plays to the same passion in several places in this country negroes have been driven out by mobs not because they were criminal or because they were bad citizens but because they were going into the grocery and drug business they were becoming doctors dentists and the like and taking away the trade of their white competitors so the stores and restaurants of highly efficient japanese were wrecked in san francisco what is easier or cruder to use as a weapon for crushing a rival than the instinctive dislike of man for man and that usage is not peculiar to the white man in africa the black man wastes no time with the different looking white man he kills him if he dares on the spot and how ably the chinaman has employed the instinctive hatred of his countrymen for foreign devils in order to fight american trade and traders 
we hate the chinaman and drive him out and he hates us and drives us out chief danger of race prejudice and this is one of the dangers of the race problem in this country the fostering of such an instinct to make money or to get political office such a basis of personal prosperity is all the more dangerous because the white man is in undisputed power in this country the negro has no great navy behind him he is like a child in the house of a harsh parent all that stands between him and destruction is the ethical sense of the white man will the white man's sense of justice and virtue be robust enough to cause him to withhold the hand of unlimited power will he see as booker t washington says that if he keeps the negro in the gutter he must stay there with him the white man and his civilization not alone the negro will rise or fall by that ethical test the negro on his part as i have shown repeatedly in former chapters employs the same methods as the white man for negro nature is not different from human nature he argues the white man hates you hate him trade with negro storekeepers employ negro doctors don't go to white dentists and lawyers out of this condition proceed two tendencies the first is the natural result of mutual fear and suspicion and that is a rapid flying apart of the races all through my former chapters i have been showing how the negroes are being segregated so are the chinese segregated and the blacks in south africa and certain classes in india parts of the south are growing blacker negroes crowd into colored quarters in the cities more and more they are becoming a people wholly apart separate in their churches separate in their schools separate in cars conveyances hotels restaurants with separate professional men in short we discover tendencies in this country toward the development of a caste system now one of the most striking facts in our recent history is the progress of the former slave and this finds its world parallel in the progress of people whom the vainglorious anglo-saxon once despised the japanese chinese and east indians in forty years the negro has advanced a distance that would have been surprising in almost any race in the bare accomplishments area of land owned crops raised professional men supported business enterprises conducted books and poetry written music composed pictures painted the slaves of forty years ago have made the most astonishing progress this leads to the second tendency which proceeds slowly out of the growing conviction that hatred and suspicion and fear as motives in either national or individual progress will not work that there must be some other way for different people to work side by side in peace and justice and thus we discover a tendency toward a friendly living together under the new relationship in which the negro is not a slave or a dependent but a man and a citizen booker t washington preaches the gospel of this new life and gradually as race prejudice becomes inconvenient threatens financial adversity ruffles the smooth current of comfortable daily existence the impulse grows to set it aside men don't keep on fighting when it is no longer profitable to fight and thus side by side these two impulses exist the one pointing toward the development of a hard caste system which would ultimately petrify our civilization as it has petrified that of india and the other looking to a reasonable kindly and honorable working together of the races 
End of Part 1 of Chapter 14part two of chapter fourteen of following the color line an account of negro citizenship in the american democracy by ray stannard baker this librivox recording is in the public domain what are the remedies for the evil conditions so much for conditions what of remedies i have heard the most extraordinary remedies proposed serious men actually talk of the deportation of the entire negro population to africa not stopping to inquire whether we have any right to deport them or calculating the economic revolution and bankruptcy which the deportation of the entire laboring class would cause in the south without stopping to think that even if we could find a spot in the world for ten million negroes and they all wanted to go that all the ships flying the american flag if constantly employed could probably not transport the natural increase of the negro population let alone the ten million present inhabitants i have heard talk of segregation in reservations like the indians segregation out of existence i have even heard unspeakable talk of the wholesale extinction of the race by preventing the breeding of children all quack remedies and based upon hatred not upon justice there is no sudden or cut-and-dried solution of the negro problem or of any other problem men are forever demanding formula which will enable them to progress without effort they seek to do quickly by medication what can only be accomplished by deliberate hygiene a problem that has been growing for two hundred and fifty years in america and for thousands of years before that in africa warping the very lives of the people concerned changing their currents of thoughts as well as their conduct cannot be solved in forty years why expect it and yet there are definite things that can be done which while working no immediate miracles will set our faces to the light and keep us trudging toward the true goal down at the bottom it will seem trite but it is eternally true the cause of the race problem and most other social problems is simply lack of understanding and sympathy between man and man and the remedy is equally simple a gradual substitution of understanding and sympathy for blind repulsion and hatred consider for example the atlanta riot increasing misunderstanding and hatred caused a dreadful explosion and bloodshed what happened instantly the wisest white men in atlanta invited the wisest colored men to meet them they got together general explanations followed they found that there had been error on both sides they found that there were reasonable human beings on both sides one of the leading white men said i did not know there were any such broad-minded negroes in the south in other words they tried to understand and sympathize with one another over and over again men will be found hating negroes or chinamen or dagoes and yet liking some individual negro or chinaman or dago when they get acquainted they see that the negro or chinaman is a human being like themselves full of faults but not devoid of good qualities as a fundamental proposition then it will be found that the solution of the negro problem lies in treating the negro more and more as a human being like ourselves treating the negro as a human being we must judge him not by his color or by any other outward symbol but upon his worth as a man nothing that fails of that full honesty and fairness of judgment in the smallest particular will suffice we disgrace and injure ourselves more than we do the negro when we are not willing to admit virtue or learning or power in another human being 
because his face happens to be yellow or black. Of the soundness of this fundamental standard of judgment there can be no doubt. The difficulty lies in applying it practically to society as it is today. In the suggestions which I offer here, I am trying to do two things. To outline the present program, and to keep open a clear view to the future goal. Shall the Negro vote? Let us approach, then, without fear, the first of the three groups of problems, political, industrial, and social, which confront us. Shall the Negro vote? Thousands of Negroes in this country are fully as well equipped, fully as patriotic, as the average white citizen. Moreover, they are as much concerned in the real welfare of the country. The principle that our forefathers fought for, taxation only with representation, is as true today as it ever was. On the other hand, the vast majority of Negroes, and many foreigners and poor whites are still densely ignorant and have little or no appreciation for the duties of citizenship it seems right that they should be required to wait before being allowed to vote until they are prepared a wise parent hedges his son about with restrictions he does not authorize his signature at the bank or allow him to run a locomotive and until he is twenty-one years old he is disfranchised and has no part in the government but the parent restricts his son because it seems the wisest course for him for the family and for the state that he should grow into manhood before he is burdened with grave responsibilities so the state limits suffrage and rightly limits it so long as it accompanies that limitation with a determined policy of education. But the suffrage law is so executed in the South today as to keep many capable Negroes from the exercise of their rights, to prevent recognition of honest merit, and it is executed unjustly as between white men and colored. It is no condonement of the Southern position to say that the North also disfranchises a large part of the Negro vote by bribery, which it does. It is only saying that the North is also wrong. As for the agitation for the repeal of the Fifteenth Amendment to the Federal Constitution, which gives the right of suffrage to the colored man, it must be met by every lover of justice and democracy with a face of adamant. If there were only one Negro in the country capable of citizenship, the way for him must, at least, be kept open. No doubt full suffrage was given to the mass of Negroes before they were prepared for it, while yet they were slaves in everything except bodily shackles, and the result during the Reconstruction period was disastrous. But the principle of a free franchise fortunately as i believe for this country has been forever established if the white man is not willing to meet the negro in any contest whatsoever without plugging the dice then he is not the superior but the inferior of the negro what shall be the industrial relation of the races so much for the political relationships of the races how about the industrial relationships? The same test of inherent worth must here also apply, and the question will not be settled until it does apply. A carpenter must be asked not, what color are you, but, how cunningly and efficiently can you build a house? Of all absurdities, the judgment of the skill of a surgeon by the kink of his hair will certainly one day be looked upon as the most absurd. The same observation applies broadly to the attempt to confine a whole people, regardless of their capabilities, to menial occupations because they are dark-colored. No, the place of the Negro is the place he can fill most efficiently, 
and the longer we attempt to draw artificial lines the longer we shall delay the solution of the race problem on the other hand the negro must not clamor for places he cannot yet fill the trouble with the negro says booker t washington is that he is all the time trying to get recognition whereas what he should do is to get something to recognize negroes as a class are today far inferior in education intelligence and efficiency to the white people as a class here and there an able negro will develop superior abilities but the mass of negroes for years to come must find their activities mostly in physical and more or less menial labor like any race they must first prove themselves in these simple lines of work before they can expect larger opportunities there must always be men like dr dubois who agitate for rights their service is an important one but at the present time it would seem that the thing most needed was the teaching of such men as dr washington emphasizing duties and responsibilities urging the negro to prepare himself for his rights social contact we come now having considered the political and industrial relationships of the races to the most difficult and perplexing of all the phases of the negro question that of social contact political and industrial relationships are more or less outward but social contact turns upon the delicate and deep questions of home life personal inclinations and of privileges rather than rights it is always in the relationships of oldest developments like those that cling around the home that human nature is slowest to change indeed much of the complexity of the negro problem has arisen from a confusion in people's minds between rights and privileges everyone recalls the excitement caused it became almost a national issue when president roosevelt invited booker t washington to luncheon at the white house well that feeling is deep in the south as deep almost as human nature many northern people who go south to live come to share it indeed it is the gravest question in ethics to decide at what point natural instincts should be curbed social contact is a privilege not a right it is not a subject for legislation or for any other sort of force social questions as colonel watterson of kentucky says create their own laws and settle themselves they cannot be forced all such relationships will work themselves out gradually naturally quietly in the long course of the years and the less they are talked about the better jim crow laws as for the jim crow laws in the south many of them at least are at present necessary to avoid the danger of clashes between the ignorant of both race they are the inevitable scaffolding of progress as a matter of fact the negro has profited in one way by such laws for the white man has thus driven the negroes together forced ability to find its outlet in racial leadership and by his severity produced a spirit of self-reliance which would not otherwise have existed dr frizzell of hampton is always talking to his students of the advantages of disadvantages as for laws against the intermarriage of the races they do not prevent what they are designed to prevent the mixing of white and colored blood in many parts of the south despite the existence of such laws miscegenation though decreasing rapidly still continues on the other hand in the north where negroes and whites may marry there is actually very little marriage and practically no concubinage the solution of this question too lies far more in education than in law as a matter of fact 
the more education both races receive the less the amalgamation in the south as in the north the present tendency of the educated and prosperous negroes is to build up a society of their own entirely apart from and independent of white people as i have shown in a former chapter a white woman in the north who marries a negro is declassed ostracized by both races the danger of amalgamation lies with ignorant and vicious people black or white not with educated and sensitive people as in the case of the jim crow laws separate schools in the south are necessary and in one way i believe them to be of great advantage to the negroes themselves in northern cities like indianapolis and new york where there are no separation laws of any kind separate schools have appeared naturally and quietly in districts where the negro population is dense that the pupils in each should be treated with exact justice in the matter of expenditures by the state is axiomatic and the negro boy should have the same unbounded opportunity for any sort of education he is capable of using as the white boy nothing less will suffice one influence at present growing rapidly will have its profound effect on the separation laws though a tendency exists towards local segregation of negroes to which i have already referred there is also a counter tendency toward a scattering of negroes throughout the entire country the white population in the south now twenty million against nine million negroes is increasing much more rapidly than the negro population the death rate of negroes is exceedingly high and the sharper the conditions of competition with white workers the greater will probably be the limitation of increase of the more inefficient negro population as for the predictions of amalgamation a mongrel people black domination and other bogies of prophecy we must not as i see it give them any weight whatsoever we cannot regulate our short lives by the fear of something far in the future which will probably never happen at all all we can do is to be right at this moment and let the future take care of itself it will anyway there is no other sane method of procedure much as we may desire it the future arrangement of this universe is not in our hands as to the matter of superiority or inferiority it is not a subject of argument at all nor can we keep or attain superiority by laws or color lines or in any other way except by being superior if we are right absolutely right in the eternal principles we can rest in peace that the matter of our superiority will take care of itself the real solution of the negro problem i remember asking a wise southern man i met what in his opinion was the chief factor in the solution of the negro problem time he said and patience but time must be occupied with discipline and education more and more education not less education education that will teach first of all the dignity of service not only for negroes but for white men the white man south and north needs it quite as much as the colored man and this is exactly the program of the new southern statesmanship of which i spoke in a former chapter these wise southerners have resolved to forget the discouragements and complexities of the negro problem forget even their disagreements and go to work on present problems the development of education and industry whether we like it or not the whole nation indeed the whole world is tied by unbreakable bonds to its negroes its chinamen its slum dwellers its thieves its murderers its prostitutes 
we cannot elevate ourselves by driving them back either with hatred or violence or neglect but only by bringing them forward by service for good comes to men not as they work alone but as they work together with that sympathy and understanding which is the only true democracy the great teacher never preached the flat equality of men social or otherwise he gave mankind a working principle by means of which being so different some white some black some yellow some old some young some men some women some accomplished some stupid mankind could after all live together in harmony and develop itself to the utmost possibility and that principle was the golden rule it is the least sentimental the most profoundly practical teaching known to men end of chapter fourteen end of following the color line an account of negro citizenship in the american democracy by ray stannard baker this recording has been by roger moline